our sermon title this morning is Believe Before It's Too Late. Believe Before It's Too Late. This is part two in a sermon that we began a couple of weeks ago in John chapter 12, our verses 37 through 50. Verses 37 through 50. So the Lord Jesus Christ is in Jerusalem. He's in Jerusalem, and it's the week of Passover. And in Jerusalem, during the week of Passover, massive crowds have gathered together into Jerusalem to remember God's salvation. They've come to remember the deliverance that God has provided for his people. And that salvation, that deliverance coming when he delivered them from bondage in Egypt, the iron furnace. And he saved the firstborn sons of Israel by the blood of a sacrificial lamb. That event in Israel's history was ordained by God to foreshadow a far greater deliverance, a far greater salvation. That salvation when God would save his people, not from Pharaoh, not from bondage in Egypt, but from their sin. Not from the physical death of the firstborn, but from the spiritual death of torment in hell forever. And that salvation also by the blood of a sacrificial lamb. The Lord Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, who has come to take away the sin of the world. The end of John chapter 12 records the end of the Lord's public ministry. The hostility against Christ is ramping up. He has once again driven the money changers and the merchants out of the temple. And his ongoing confrontation with the religious elite in Israel, in Jerusalem specifically, has led to the decision of the Sanhedrin to kill him. The too many in the crowd have come to Jerusalem, are now confused. They're disappointed. He has become a confusing and disappointing symbol of unmet messianic expectations. He's simply not the conquering king that they were looking for. They had their eyes set on a short deliverance, right? On a subpar salvation. John's words in the prologue have been proven true. He has come to his own, and his own did not receive him. Now, there's just a short time left, a short time left before they will crucify their Messiah, and the light of this world is snuffed out. In verse 35 of chapter 12, the Lord says, a little while longer, a little while longer the light is with you. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness overtake you. He who walks in darkness does not know where he's going. While you have the light, believe in the light that you may become sons of light. And these things Jesus spoke and departed. And in an act of judgment on those very words, he was hidden from their sight. Now, this is the last days in the public ministry of Christ come to a short and seemingly unmessiah like end. John, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit here in John chapter 12, is compelled to give a biblical explanation for the rampant unbelief that we've seen. Why are there so few who truly believe? Why are these people about to crucify their Messiah? How is all this to be explained? What do we need to think about these things? Especially, how are these things to be explained to a Jew, considering Christianity after the cross. How are we to understand these things? Now, the first reason that John gives for this unbelief is in verse 37, and it's that unbelief here was prophesied. Unbelief was prophesied. In verse 37, John says, but although he had done so many signs before them, they did not believe in him so that, verse 38, the word of Isaiah the prophet might be fulfilled, which he spoke. Lord, who has believed our report? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? In other words, in Isaiah chapter 53, God said this would happen. God said that this would happen. Isaiah said he is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we did not esteem him. So the first reason that John gives for unbelief is that it was prophesied. The second reason that John gives for unbelief is that unbelief is the judgment of God. Unbelief is the judgment of God. Verse 39, therefore, they could not believe. They were unable to believe. Now why? 
Because Isaiah said again, verse 40, he, God, has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts, lest, unless, unless they should see with their eyes, lest they should understand with their hearts and turn so that I should heal them. Now, get the point from this passage of scripture. This unbelief that we see in John is because God has decided that it should be so. In other words, God said, I'm going to blind their spiritual eyes and I'm going to harden their heart because I'm not going to save them. Do you see? This is the judgment of God. Now you can't do any grammatical gymnastics with that wording in John chapter 12, verses 39 and 40. That's what the text clearly says. You refuse to believe, and so God will make sure to it that you don't believe or that you can't believe. So many people today are unfamiliar with the Bible, unfamiliar with the teaching of Scripture. So many churches today fail to actually teach the Bible, and so most people today don't realize that this is what actually the word of God says. They don't realize that God actually does this. You refuse to believe, you reject, you reject, you reject, and so God will see to it that you can't believe, that the word there is unable, that you are unable to believe. The Jews, by and large, rejected God. They rejected God's word to them, and so God had treated them with grace and treated them with kindness and treated them with patience treated them with mercy, treated them with compassion. God gave his word to them, and many said, I'm not going to do it. I will not follow you, God. I will not have God to rule over me. And so, in the judgment of God, I will not follow you, soon became, I cannot follow you. Now, the third reason that John gives for unbelief here is that true belief is costly. The reason that John gives here for unbelief, the third reason, is that true belief is costly. Look at verse 40, 42. Verse 42, nevertheless, even among the rulers, many believed in him. Now, we unpacked that statement in the last sermon. We know for several reasons that this represents the same kind of superficial counterfeit of genuine faith that we've seen in John before. Now, how do we know that? Well, one reason is, as you go through verse 44, because, but because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him. They say they believe, but because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue, for they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. Now, John exposes their so-called belief as a counterfeit. He exposes their so-called belief as a lie. The kind of belief mentioned in verse 42 falls under the condemnation of the Lord Jesus Christ in John chapter 5, verse 44, where the Lord says, How can you believe, you who receive honor from one another and do not seek the honor that comes from the only God? James brings up this point, doesn't he? When he says that even the demons believe and they tremble. There's a distinctive difference between the belief of a demon and the belief of a Christian. What makes your belief different than theirs? How is it that you believe in a way that is different from the way that the demons believe? Now, these three reasons for unbelief are still around today. They're still around today, right? First reason, unbelief has been prophesied. That's true of us today, right? 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1 says, but know this. Then in the last days, that's, those are the days that we're in now, right? The last days. In the last days, perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong. Sounds like our country, doesn't it? Sounds like most churches, doesn't it? Haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 3. For the time will come, and it has come today, when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, 
They will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. It has been prophesied, and we see these texts fulfilled in our own day, don't we? First reason, unbelief has been prophesied. The second reason, unbelief today is the judgment of God. Unbelief today is the judgment of God. Speaking of unbelievers, even in our day, Paul said in Romans chapter 1, verse 28, that they didn't like to retain God in their knowledge. Unbelievers don't like to retain God in their knowledge. And so Paul says, God gave them over to a debased mind. You notice the wording there. God gave them over to a debased mind. This is the judgment of God. To do those things which are not fitting, being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness. They're full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness. They are whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things. Wow, this list, right? Disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful, who, knowing the righteous judgment of God, that those who practice such things are deserving of death, not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. Proverbs chapter 1, verse 29. Because they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord, they would have none of my counsel, God said, and they despised my every rebuke. Therefore, in the judgment of God, they shall eat the fruit of their own way and be filled to the full with their own fancies. It's the judgment of God. But the third reason, unbelief is everywhere today because genuine belief is costly. Genuine belief is costly. Genuine believers, true believers in Christ, are those who turn from their sin, who turn to Christ in faith and forsake all to follow Christ. According to Luke chapter 9, verse 23, genuine believers are those who deny themselves, they take up their cross daily, and they actually follow Christ in obedience to his commands. Now, so few actually do that today because it's going to cost you something. It's going to cost you. Most professing Christians today are superficial, hypocritical fakes. The modern day so-called church has turned this kind of unbelief into a multi-billion dollar industry. They've packaged this unbelief and they are selling it to the masses and the masses are gobbling it up. Paul prophesied that in the last days perilous times would come and that men would be lovers of themselves and lovers of money. And so the so-called modern day professing church today preaches and often by its silence that you're not an object of God's wrath. You're not condemned already. You love yourself? Well, that's great news because God loves you too. And he has a wonderful plan for your life. You can have everything you want, including heaven. They'll entertain you. They'll be careful never to offend you. Right? Paul said that the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. And so most churches today don't teach doctrine. Paul said that unbelievers don't like to retain God in their knowledge. And so the church today teaches that you're a Christian, even though you very seldom ever think of him, very seldom ever pray to him, you care little to know him, you care even less about his word, and explains why you're, why you're still biblically illiterate, although you've been a Christian for years. And then he goes on to describe the congregations of most churches, filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness. They are whisperers, backbiters, haters of God. Modern-day so-called church has packaged unbelief, attempting to make it look like real, genuine, true, saving faith. And they're selling that package to the masses. And the masses are eating it up. People are eating, aren't they? They're eating it up. See the rise of the mega church in our country. People are eating this stuff up by the, by the millions, millions. Jeremiah chapter five, 
verse 30, God says, listen to this, an astonishing and horrible thing has been committed in the land. The prophets prophesy falsely, the priests rule by their own power, and my people love to have it so. But then he answers that, the very important question at the end of his statement, he asks, but what will you do in the end? What will you do in the end? All of that is like cotton candy that you swallow down, believing somehow it's going to cure your terminal cancer. What are you going to do in the end? What are you going to do when you're standing at death's door? Here, specifically, what are you going to do when you stand before God with your mouth full of that cotton candy? Everybody has an opinion about how to get to heaven. And they believe that they're right. But your beliefs are going to get you to hell unless you believe lined up with what Scripture teaches. You know, years out witnessing, you know, one person after another, one person after another witnessing. If you've been out evangelizing, you know what I'm, exactly what I'm talking about. One person after another just regurgitating what they've taught, what they've been taught, regurgitating what they believe, quote unquote. How do you know that you're saved? How do you know that you're saved? I prayed and asked Jesus into my heart. <laughs> Where's that in the Bible? How do you know that you're saved? I'm a good person. I'm a good person and I've asked for forgiveness. How do you know that you're saved? I believe that God is with me and he's not against me. How do you know that you're saved? God knows what's in my heart. He knows what's in my heart. Yes, he does. How do you know that you're saved? By spoken tongues. How do you know that you're saved? I've done the best that I could. Very few people today actually know what the Bible teaches. Very few people actually know what the Bible teaches. So as John closes out chapter 12, he records here in chapter 12 a brief statement from the Lord Jesus Christ beginning in verse 44. Now, it's a statement on what it means to truly believe. It's a statement on what it means to be truly and genuinely saved. Woven into this statement are also the consequences of unbelief. It's a statement on what it means to be truly a believer, to be genuinely saved, but also you'll see here consequences of unbelief. The first point that I want you to see, beginning in verse 44, is that you must believe in who he is. You must believe in who he is. We're going to build, through the course of the next 45 minutes or so, a biblical theology of faith, a biblical theology of biblical belief. What does it mean to believe? The Lord Jesus Christ calls you to believe. John says, I've written these things so that you may believe that he is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life in his name. What does it mean to believe in Christ? Verse 44. Then Jesus cried out, and he said... He who believes in me believes not in me, but in him who sent me. And he who sees me sees him who sent me. I have come as a light into the world that whoever believes in me should not abide in darkness. As Jesus opens with these words, he's likely in the temple, right? In the temple complex, in the temple area, and he cries out with a loud voice. This is open air preaching, right? This is maximum volume, maximum reach. He's using his big boy voice, okay? And he's said to have cried out like this here in the temple in the same way that he cried out in John chapter 7 at the Feast of Tabernacles, an open air proclamation of the gospel. The only other times that the Lord is said to have cried out this way, there are two times at the cross, and there's one other time when he cried out at the tomb of Lazarus. We've been through that passage together. Here and in John chapter 7, he is preaching in the temple complex. Now, this is forceful. It's authoritative and it's passionate, isn't it? He cries out. It's passionate. The Lord crying out in the temple ahead of his death for men to turn to him to be saved from the wrath of God. This is him pleading with the people to be saved pleading with a proclamation of the gospel for people to turn from their sin and flee the wrath that is coming. Now let's unpack then the content of what he's saying here. The Lord makes three basic statements here about who he is. 
three statements about who he is. The first statement is in verse 44. He is God's sent representative. He is God's sent representative. The second of the three statements is in verse 45. He is God's sent representation. God's sent representation. And in verse 46, point three, he is God's sent revelation. He is God's sent representative, God's sent representation, and he is God's sent revelation. Let's look at the first one together in verse 44. He is God's sent representative. In verse 44, Jesus cried out and said, he who believes in me, believes not in me, but in him who sent me. Now, this statement is actually a Jewish maxim. It's a Jewish maxim or a statement of truth. The person sent, what's being communicated, is that the person who is sent is as the one who sent him. He's a perfect ambassador, right? A perfect representative. The person sent is as the one who sent him. The grammar of the maxim also speaks of representation and could also be worded this way. He who believes in me believes not only or not merely in me, but also or even principally in him who sent me. Do you see? The same idea is expressed in John 13. Just flip the page to John 13 and look down at verse 20. John 13, look at verse 20. Here the Lord said, Most assuredly I say to you, he who receives whomever I send receives me. And he who receives me receives him who sent me. It's the same concept, okay? It's a concept of representation, representation. Jesus is saying here in John chapter 12, I am the perfect representative of God the Father. To believe in me, Jesus is saying, is to believe in him. You believe me, you believe in the one who sent me. That means to hear from Christ is to hear from God. It also means that to come to God is to come through Christ. Flip one more page and look at John chapter 14. John chapter 14. Let's look at the implications of this representation beginning in verse 1, right? John 14, verse 1. He is God's sent representative to man, a perfect representation of the Father. Verse 1 says... Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God? Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. Verse 3, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Where I go, you know, and the way you know. But Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, listen, I am the way, the truth, and the life, the perfect representation of the Father, so no one comes to the Father except through me. In other words, I represent the Father to you. There is no other Savior. There is no other path to God. There is no other option for man. There is no other name given among men under heaven by which we must be saved right? No one comes to the Father except through me. Look at verse 7. If you had actually known me, then you would have known my Father also. Same concept, right? And from now on, you know him and have seen him. So Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it is sufficient for us. But Jesus said to him, verse 9, have I been with you so long, Philip, and yet you have not known me? He who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father in me? The words that I speak to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does the works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the sake of the works themselves. Now, all that in John 14 points us to our second point about who he is. The first point, he is a perfect representation of the Father. Second point, in verse 45, he is God's set representation. He is God's sent representation. Verse 45 says, And he who sees me sees him who sent me. We see that in John chapter 14, verse 9, right? He who has seen me has seen the Father. In verse 45, John chapter 12, verse 45, the verb sees there is present tense. 
means it's an ongoing perpetual truth. It's ongoing. If you see Christ, you see the Father. It carries the sense of whoever looks on me, Jesus says, is at the same time, in reality, actually looking on God the Father. And Jesus Christ is God in the flesh. John chapter 10, verse 30, the Lord makes the statement, I and the Father are one. I and my Father are one. We saw this concept in John chapter 14, verse 9, with Thomas, but it's also true for us today. As you look in the pages of your Bible, right, as you study the Word of God, as you look through these texts, you see Christ on the pages of Scripture, don't you? In Scripture, it's not just here talking about viewing his physical form, but it's talking about seeing Christ. We see his heart, don't we? We see his authority. We see his passion. We see his wisdom, his compassion. We see his mercy. We see his righteous indignation against sin. Don't we? We see in Christ, on the pages of the Bible, an exact representation of the Father. Colossians chapter 1, verse 15 says that he is the image of the invisible God. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1. Listen to the author of the letter to the Hebrews. God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom he also made the worlds, who, Christ, being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become so much better than the angels as he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. He is the express image of the person of God. Now, he's the perfect represent, representative of God. And he is the perfect representation of God, his express image. He is the perfect representative of God in all that he says and all that he does. He's the perfect representation of God being the express image of his person. Fully God and yet distinct from the Father. Christ is the exact representation of God's nature. It says there that he's the brightness of his glory, right? So as, as God the Father, as the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ are the beams of his glory, right? The sunbeams, the radiating light from the glory of God. Hebrews 1 points us then to the third statement about who Christ is back in John chapter 12. The third statement about who Christ is. In verse 46, he is God's sent revelation. God's revelation to the world. Verse 46 The Lord says, I have come as a light into the world that whoever believes in me should not abide in darkness. Now think about, very simply, what a light is intended to do. A light is intended to illuminate, right? To illumine. Jesus Christ has come as a light into the world. Now who is Jesus Christ illuminating? He's illuminating God the Father. He is the light, God's light to this dark world. He's illuminating God the Father. Jesus Christ is the revealer of God. Now, how so? How so? Think about it. As we learn and as we meditate on the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ, we come to know God, don't we? As you think about the person and the work of of the Lord Jesus Christ, we know what God is like. As we look at the work of the Lord Jesus Christ on the, on the cross, we see the love of God, don't we? As we think about the work of the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross, we see the justice of God. In the cross, the justice of God. We see God's hatred for sin. We see God's mercy to man. As we look at the perfect life, of the Lord Jesus Christ, we see the holiness of God. As we look at those whom the Lord saves, we see the mercy of God, the power of God. When we look at Christ, we see God. And so, think about it, put those three points together. 
Christ is the perfect representative of God. Christ is the perfect, perfect representation of God. And Christ is God's perfect revelation to man. That means then, as the Lord is stating in John chapter 12, verses 44, 45, and 46, that faith in Christ is not simply faith or trust in just another man. That's why the Mormons and the Jehovah's Witnesses have this so wrong. And if you do not believe that I am, Jesus says, you will die in your sins. Faith in Christ is not simply faith or trust in just another created being, just another created man. It's not even faith simply in another prophet of God. But faith in Christ, as communicated here in verses 44, 45, and 46, faith in Christ is indeed faith in God. Do you see? Mediated, that faith mediated by God's perfect and preeminent self-revelation in his Son, our Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, why then was he sent by the Father? Why was he sent by the Father? Well, he explains the purpose of his coming at the end of verse 46. Look at the end of verse 46. So that whoever believes in me should not abide in darkness, but the grace and mercy of God in providing salvation for his people. That whoever believes in me should not abide in darkness. Apart from saving faith, right? Apart from genuine biblical belief in the Lord Jesus Christ, you are abiding in darkness. Apart from Christ, you are abiding in darkness. Jesus says, you don't believe in me? You're in darkness. Now, what does it mean to abide in darkness? Flip a few pages back to John chapter 3. John chapter 3. What does it mean to abide in darkness? I hope you're beginning to put all this together. Just keep putting it together as we work through the text. Keep putting it together. We want to apply this to our life. Look at John chapter 3. Look down beginning at verse 16. John chapter 3, verse 16. What does it mean to abide in darkness? Verse 16 says this, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. You see there again, the command, the exhortation, the call to believe in Christ for everlasting life, right? Look at verse 17. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. You see similarities between this text and John chapter 12? John chapter 12 becomes, in essence, a summary of the gospel, a summary of the Lord's teaching. Verse 18, he who, again, here it is again, he who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Now listen, here's what abiding in darkness looks like, verse 19. And this is the condemnation that light has come into the world and men loved darkness rather than the light because their deeds were evil. Verse 20, for everyone practicing evil hates the light. It does not come to the light lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who does the truth comes to the light that his deeds may be clearly seen, that they have been done in God. How do you know that you're abiding in darkness? How do you know that you're abiding in darkness? Because you love darkness. Because you love darkness. Verse 19, here's the condemnation, right? This is the condemnation that hangs over your head if you're not genuinely and truly and biblically in Christ. If you've not been united to him through repentance and faith, this is what hangs over your head. This is the condemnation. Here it is. The light, the revealer of God, God's perfect representative, his perfect representation, his perfect revelation to man has come into the world. That light reveals God in all his glory, in all his splendor, but also in all his holiness, in all his grace, in all his mercy, and in his justice. 
And it is condemnation. And this is the condemnation. That light has come into the world, revealing God for who he is. And men loved darkness rather than the light. God reveals himself to sinful man. And what does sinful man do? They love their darkness. They love their own lives. They love their own, what? Their own way. And they exclude, they disregard, they disrespect, they shove off any revelation of God. And they would take to themselves their own way, their own lives. Men loved their darkness rather than the light that God has brought into the world. You see? That has, it's justifiable that that is condemned, isn't it? God created you. How is it that you would not live wholeheartedly for him? How is it that you will spurn the grace and mercy of God in the light that has come into the world with your unbelief? Why? Because you just love your darkness. That's why. You love your sin. Look at verse 20. Everyone practicing evil. That's all of those outside of Christ. If you're not in Christ, you are practicing evil. Even the good that you do, Isaiah says, is as a filthy rag to God. It's not done by faith in him for his glory, but it's done for yourself. How many times have you, quote unquote, done good works because of the way that it makes you feel? Makes me feel good. Put your thumbs under your overall straps. You walk around strutting your stuff like how good I am, right? You're practicing evil. Those things aren't done for God's glory. Those things are done for your glory. Why do we have wicked, wicked men who become great philanthropists? Because they're glorifying themselves and they're giving. They're not glorifying God. Everyone practicing this evil, everyone outside of Christ is a God hater. Everyone practicing evil hates the light and they don't want to come into the light lest their deeds should be exposed. But listen, verse 21, he who does the truth comes to the light. I want to please God. God, all my heart, all my soul, all my mind, all my strength, I want to please him who made me and even more yet gave himself to redeem me. So I want to please him. Everyone who does the truth comes to the light and embraces the light and loves the light and cherishes the light and treasures the light and lives in the life and walks in the light that his deeds may be clearly seen that they have been done in God because Every genuine believer does that, lives that way for the glory of God. We want to see God glorified in our lives, right? Glorified in our actions, glorified in our thoughts. How do you know that you're abiding in darkness? Because you love darkness. How do you know that you're abiding in darkness? Because you make a practice of evil. You love the things of this world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. You've made a practice of your anger. You've made a practice of your selfishness. You've made a practice of your drunkenness. You've made a practice of your lies. You've made a practice of your pornography. You've made a practice of your greed. You love darkness. And so the things of God just have no interest to you. They're not compelling to you. You have no interest in the light of God's word, the light of his gospel, or the light of his church. So what do you do? Then, how do you react? When someone comes along to you, right? They come to you and they share the light of God's word with you, right? They, they, they illumine you. How do you respond? They expose your darkness to the truth of God's light. Well, you hate the light and so you get defensive. You get angry, you shove it off. You do whatever you can in your life to keep that thing 10 foot away from you, right? Your 10 foot pole. You try and justify yourself. You become self-righteous. You get defensive. You get angry. But what did Jesus say? Jesus said they hated him. Why? They hated him because he testified of the world that its deeds are evil. And they crucified him for it. They crucified him for it. That's why the, the, the gospel today is still hated and despised in this world. That's why you can't turn on your TV anymore without seeing just a blatant, overt rejection of the things of God. Because it is a light that has illumined the evil in this world. 
And men hate the light. Apart from Christ, you abide in darkness. So what must you do? What must you do then? The Lord here in great grace, in great mercy, is proclaiming the light. He is the light. He is illuminating the grace and mercy of God and the gospel. What must you do? What's the remedy? How can you be saved? How can, you be, how can you be saved? How can you flee the wrath of God that is coming in judgment on this world that is condemned already because it hasn't believed in the light? What are you to do? You're to repent. You're to turn from that sin. Turn from the error of your way. Turn from living life for yourself and believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ. Now again, what does that mean to believe in him? One, as we've already covered, it's believing who he is. Believe in God's supreme self-revelation. Humbling yourself. Humble yourself to come to him in the light with all of your filth being exposed. And believing God's revelation of him as well as God's revelation of who you are. Secondly, you need to believe in what he said. You need to believe in what he said. Verse 47. John chapter 12, verse 47. Believe in what he has said. The Lord says, and if anyone hears my words and does not believe, I do not judge him. For I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. He who rejects me, verse 48, and does not receive my words, has that which judges him. The word that I have spoken will judge him in the last day. Second point is you must believe who he is. Jesus said, if you do not believe that I am, you will die in your sins. And... You must believe in what he has said. Jesus Christ is the express image of the person of God the Father. He is God's supreme revelation to man. And the Lord's words are the words of God the Father. In chapter 12, verse 49, For I have not spoken on my own authority, but the Father who sent me gave me a command what I should say and what I should speak. In John chapter 1, verse 1, John says this, In the beginning was the was the Word, right? And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He's calling Jesus Christ here the Word of God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him nothing was made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. Later, John would say, in the same chapter, that the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. As the revelation of God, the word of God, the Lord's mission in coming was not to condemn. Right? Put that together with John chapter 3. The world is condemned already. You were born in sin as a son of Adam. You're condemned already. The mission of the Lord Jesus Christ was not to come to condemn the world, but he comes into the world to save the world. And John says these things are written that you might believe in him. Jesus says, I came to seek and to save that which is lost. Verse 47, I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. Condemnation already hangs over the head of all people outside of Christ, right? The verdict is in. The sentencing phase is already complete. And they await execution. Apart from the Lord Jesus Christ, you are under a death sentence. You're under a death sentence. The only hope for you is that there's a pardon. That there's a pardon. And Jesus has come to preach a pardon for sin. Liberty to the captives. Now look at verse 47 and 48. I want you to see this pardon is offered by grace through faith, and you must believe his word. Now, what does it mean to believe what he has said, to believe his word? Verse 47, if anyone hears, right? If anyone hears, verse 48, he rejects me and does not receive my words. Look at those two words, hear and receive. And I want to show you, depict this for you in the Gospel of John. Flip a few pages back to the left to John chapter 8. John chapter 8. And what does it mean to believe, to truly believe in what he has said? It means that you both hear. And what does it mean to hear? It means that you receive. What does it mean to receive? We'll see that in John chapter 8. And look down beginning at verse 31. This is the connection. I want to make this connection for you between hearing 
and doing. John chapter 8, verse 31. And Jesus said to those Jews who believed him, If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. What does it mean to abide in his word? Hear his word? Receive his word? Now the Lord says abide in his word? But what does all this mean? Look at verse 33. They answered him, We're Abraham's descendants and have never been in bondage to anyone. How can you say you'll be made free? Well, Jesus answered them, Most assuredly, I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin, and a slave does not abide in the house forever, but a son abides forever. Therefore, if the son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. He contrasts freedom in Christ with slavery. A slave is a slave to sin, Slave to sin is one who practices sin. If the Son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. Look at verse 37. I know that you're Abraham's descendants, but you seek to kill me because my word has no place in you. They're not abiding in his word, so what are they doing? They're seeking to kill him, right? Connecting life with his word, what you do with what you hear. Look at verse 39 or verse 38. I speak what I have seen with my father, and you do what you have seen with your father. They answered and said to him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said to them, if you were Abraham's children, listen, you would do the works of Abraham. But now you seek to kill me, a man who has told you the truth. See how doing and telling, right? Hearing and doing, how it's all connected together. I've told you the truth, which I heard from God. Abraham did not do this. You do the deeds of your father. They said to him, we are not born of fornication. We have one father, God. Jesus said to them, listen, if God were your father, you would love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God, nor have I come of myself, but he sent me. Why do you not understand my speech? Why is that? Because you are not able, very interesting there, not able not able, not able to hear, to listen to my word. You are of your father the devil and the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murder, murderer from the beginning, does not stand in the truth of God's word because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his, from his own resources for he's a liar and the father of it. But because I tell the truth, you do not believe me. Which of you convicts me of sin? And I, if I tell you the truth, why do you not believe me? What is the evidence of their unbelief? The fact that they don't do what he says. The fact that they don't do what he says. They're not born of their father God. They're not doing the works of God, the will of God. They're born of their father the devil. And so they do that which their father has done. He who is of God, listen, he who is of God hears God's words. Therefore, you do not hear because you are not of God. Making that connection between hearing and doing. To believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, to believe in what he has said, is to hear and receive and abide and obey what he has said. Lord Jesus Christ says, who is it that loves me? He who keeps my commandments. Keeps my commandments. The ultimate consequence of unbelief is judgment. The ultimate consequence of unbelief is judgment. Look at verse 48, back in John chapter 12, verse 48. The Lord says, he didn't come to condemn the world. The world was condemned already. He didn't come to judge the world at this point. He's come for the purpose of seeking and saving that which is lost. But, verse 48, he who rejects me, he who does not receive my words has that which judges him. The word that I have spoken will judge him in the last day. The word of God comes, right? The word of the Lord Jesus Christ. God's perfect representation, God's perfect revelation comes to you. It's coming to you now. It's coming to you now. You can hear and receive, turn from sin, faith in Christ, and obey and live for him. If you do not, if you reject it, judgment is the consequence. 
He didn't come to judge the world, but by virtue of his bringing his revelation to you, if you reject that revelation, the consequence is judgment. Now, Christ will come back in the last day to judge the world. And his judgment is not arbitrary, like the God of Islam. It's not arbitrary. His judgment is according to his word. His perfect, inviolable, unchangeable word will judge you. It's already set in stone. And it's set in stone in this book. His word. His words. And that's not arbitrary. If you look at verse 48, the word there for words is the word rhema, which means his actual words, not merely the concepts. His actual word will judge you. The word for reject, he who rejects me, means to set aside or to disregard. Some people perceive in that statement, he who rejects me, meaning that I need to like verbally and physically know Jesus Christ. I don't want to have anything to do with you. No, no, no. No, no, that's not what it means. He who rejects me merely means to set it aside or to disregard it. Disregard it. Light has come into the world. Because light has come into the world, you and I are responsible to respond to that truth. You and I are responsible to respond to that reality. You're not left in a neutral position. There is no neutral position. There is no position between black and white, right? You must receive and respond and hear and abide and obey. If you don't do that, then you by default are setting aside, disregarding, rejecting. And that leads to judgment. You think about it this way, as an example. You set aside or disregard a law in our country, right? As you're driving down the road, you set aside or disregard the speed limit. These can be acts of commission or acts of omission, right? You set aside or disregard the laws in our country about paying your taxes. An act of omission, you don't do that which you've been commanded by our government to do. What do they call that? They call it tax evasion. You can be arrested for that and put in jail, right? You commit a crime in our country, either commission or omission, you're arrested and you go before the judge. The judge there is presiding over the court case, but it's the law that testifies against you. It's the law that testifies against you. Here's what the law says, and here's what you've done. You're pronounced guilty, having been judged by the word judged by the law. Amen? Works the same way. This is his word to you today. We're hearing the word of God today out of his word. And his word, even this very sermon, will stand in judgment against you in that day if you set it aside or disregard it or neglect it or reject it. This is the authority of God's word. It's not my authority, my authority. It's not what I say or what I think. This is the word of God. And if you set it aside, if you neglect it, if you reject it, if you disregard it, this word will judge you in that day. It will stand as a testimony against you. I want you to see that word, whether it's received or not, is confirmed then in your works. His word comes to you in the form of a command. You have then... The opportunity to receive, to hear, to obey, to abide in that, or to reject, to set it aside, to disregard it. What will you do? His word to you comes today. This word then is confirmed in your response to it, how you live, what you do, how you live your life. It's confirmed by how you live. It bears witness. It bears witness to what you believe about that word. If you believe it, you obey it. You abide in it. You adhere to it. If you reject it, you don't believe it, right? I want to put that together for you. Turn, I want to go through three texts with you very quickly, very quickly. I want to make this connection for you. Turn first to James chapter 2. James chapter 2. To hear and to receive his words, verse 47 and 48 in John chapter 12, is to do, is to live, is to obey, is to abide. And that's illustrated for us. For example, first text is James chapter 2. Look down at verse 14. 
James chapter 2, beginning in verse 14. Now let this sink in. Verse 14, what is the profit, my brethren? If someone says he has faith, if someone says, I believe, but he doesn't have works, can that kind of faith save him? If a brother or sister is naked, destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, depart in peace, be warm, be filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? Thus also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. Listen, you say you believe, but if you don't back it up with a Christian life, if you don't back it up with action, back it up with works, this isn't a salvation by works. This is a salvation that works. This is a true saving faith that produces genuine biblical fruit, all right? But someone will say, verse 18, listen, you have faith, I have works. Say we're having a conversation, right? We're having a conversation. You have faith, I have works. And I would say to you, show me your faith without your works. Can you do it? No, it's impossible. I can't see it, taste it, touch it, feel it. What's faith? I can't see it. You show your faith by your works. That's the point he's making here. Show me your faith without your works, and I'll show you my faith by my works. Verse 19, you believe there is one God, you do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. But do you want to know, O oh foolish man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified? Was not his faith affirmed? Was not his faith confirmed by works when he offered Isaac his son on the altar? You know the story from the Old Testament, right? What led Abraham to the top of that mountain with his son and a knife in his hand? Faith in God. Trust in God. He believed God, and he lived like it. Go with me quickly to Matthew chapter 25. Matthew chapter 25. This word is going to judge you in the last day. This word before the great judge of all the earth, the Lord Jesus Christ, will judge you in the last day. Matthew chapter 25. And it's going to be this, a judgment based on what you have done, based on your works. It's as if the Lord looks, right? And the Lord knows the heart. The Lord looks on the heart. The Lord knows your faith, whether you have it or don't. But the Lord looks for the confirming works of your faith and it's by his law, according to those works, that he judges you. We see that really clearly in Matthew chapter 25. And look down beginning at verse 31. Verse 31, the Lord says, When the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the holy angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory, and all the nations. And this is what's going to happen. This is what is going to happen. This is coming. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he'll separate them one from another. As a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats, he'll set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Because, look at verse 35, I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, you gave me drink. I was a stranger, you took me in. I was naked, you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. You say, wait a minute, wait a minute now. I thought that salvation was by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. And what's all this about doing these things? And because you did these things, now you can come into heaven and be with me. What's that all about? This is his word, is it not? I didn't come and scribble that in your Bible overnight. <laughs> it's because these works affirm and confirm the presence of genuine, true, real, saving faith. The grace of God that comes to you is a grace that is full of power, right? God indwells you with his Holy Spirit when you're genuinely saved. And by virtue of his grace at work in you, by virtue of his indwelling Holy Spirit, you, by the grace of God, in the power of the Spirit, live for him. You obey him. The fruit of your life becomes a life lived in obedience to the Lord. And so you do these things. You see him hungry, you give him food. 
You see him thirsty, you give him a drink. They asked him, in verse 37, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you? When did we see you thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in or naked and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king, the Lord Jesus Christ, will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. You did it to me. Verse 41. But then, he'll also say to those goats on the left hand, Depart from me, you cursed, into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Because, verse 42, I was hungry, you gave me no food. I was thirsty, you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, you did not take me in. Naked, you did not clothe me. And in prison, uh, you did not visit me. Then they're going to answer him in desperation, in a pleading, right? Crying out to justify themselves because they've lived in darkness, their deeds were evil. Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or stranger? You see the reversal of the perspective, right? The reversal of the perspective. When did we see you naked or sick or in prison and did not minister to you? He'll answer to them saying, assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. The judgment of God, and it's a judgment according to your works. Turn to Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20. If you find that it is impossible for you to live the Christian life in and of yourself, it's because it is. This is a work of God in the heart of man. And if you don't have this resulting fruit then you must be born again. You must cry out to God to produce it in you. Humble yourself and throw yourself at the cross. Plead with Christ to change your heart, to indwell you with his spirit, and to cause you, by his grace and mercy to you, to walk in his judgments and do them. Revelation chapter 20, look at verse 11. I saw a great white throne, and him who sat on it, this is coming, this is coming soon. There'll be a great white throne. Him who sat on it, that's the Lord Jesus Christ. From his face, the earth and the heaven fled away. This is at the, the uncreation of all things. All things will melt with a fervent heat. All things that we see will be destroyed. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God. That's kings and presidents and princes and nobody's like me, right? Nobody's like you. And the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books by his word. By his word. His word testifies against them. We can't confuse these concepts. Saved by grace, through faith, judged by works. And great. Now, an Arminian can't put those things together. Can't put them together. Saved by grace through faith, but you're judged according to your works. Now, why isn't it that you are saved then by your works? Because those works aren't produced by you. You're saved by grace through faith, and then God himself produces the works in you. What has the church done today? They have stripped the gospel of all of its miracle, wonder-working power to change a life. By saying, you can be a Christian and live however you want to live. Be a Christian. Live however you want to live. They have stripped the gospel of this power. Saved by grace, through faith, judged by your works. Those works produced in God, in you, by his spirit. They were judged according to their, their works by the things which were written in the books. Verse 13. The sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one... According to his works, each one of you, each one of us, judged according to our works, then death and Hades were cast in the lake of fire. This is the second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life, when was that book written? When was that written, that book of life? When was that written? Before the foundation of the world. Anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Now think for a moment. 
think for a moment about all the arguments that will be made at the great white throne judgment by men standing before Christ in judgment. Think about all the arguments. Far worse, right? This is far worse, far worse than marching the path to the gallows where you're about to hang. Far worse, right? Far worse than the, the anxiety, the angst that would come up upon you if you were marched to the block where you'd place your head to be chopped off. Far worse. Because this is eternity. This is eternity. This is heaven or hell. Far worse. Far worse than the anxiety of walking down the hallway to go see a boss that you know is about to fire you. Right? Far worse. Far worse than facing a spurned wife or a spurned husband. Far worse. Far worse. You know this is for eternity. This is eternal torment. Eternal torment. Facing the blackness of darkness forever. What kind of excuses, right, will be shouted, will be pled before the throne? What kind of arguments will be made? I've been a good person. Lord, I've been a good person. Haven't my, has my good outweighed my bad? I've tried the best I could. I've did everything I could. How many good things have I done, God? Please. Right, desperation. I didn't do anything truly awful. God, I never stole a car thought about it. I didn't physically murder anyone. I was angry all the time. I'm a good person, but Jesus commanded, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. It'll be his word. It'll be that word that judges you. You see? The commandment of God is not to be a good person. The commandment of God is to be a perfect person. Lord, I said the sinner's prayer. And listen, I meant it. I meant it in my heart. Jesus didn't command you to say a prayer. In that sense, Jesus commanded you to repent and believe in the gospel. Lord, I went to Cornerstone Baptist Church. That church preached the gospel. Those people love the Lord. Look at all I did there in your name. I went out witnessing with those brothers and sisters. I went to church with those brothers and sisters. I fellowshiped on Sundays. But Jesus says, I will declare to you, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Do you see what it comes down to? Works produced in faith. Works produced in faith. You're judged according to your works. Whoever hears these sayings of mine, Jesus says, and what? Does them. And does them. I will liken him to a wise man who built his house upon the rock. That's why you can't come to a sermon like this, or can't come to a church like this, can't sit before the word of God like this, and walk away and not do anything. You can't come on Christmas and Easter only and placate a guilty conscience and think you're right before God. You're not. You'll face God in judgment, and it'll be according to your works, and his judgment is just. Paul says that the undeniable proof of all this is the resurrection. It's the resurrection. The proof of all this is the resurrection. Acts chapter 17, verse 30. Truly, these times of ignorance, God has overlooked. But now, what does he do? He commands. But now commands all men everywhere to what? To repent. That's right. Because he has appointed a day. It's this day that we're talking about. He has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. And he has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. You want to know that judgment is coming? Look at the resurrection. You want to know that judgment is coming? Look at the fact that God has raised the Lord Jesus Christ from the dead. 32, when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, while others said, we'll hear you again on this matter. What's your response going to be? Do you mock at these things? You just justify yourself. You're arguing with me in your mind right now. Just arguing in your mind, right? No, 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 no. It's, it's, that's not what this is all about. This is the word of God, people. <laughs> or are you going to hear him? Remember the flood, right? Remember the flood. God has already destroyed this wicked world with a flood. He's soon going to judge this world with fire. Acts 17 makes a suitable transition to our third point, right? 
One, you must believe who he is. Two, you must believe what he has said. Three, you must believe in obedience to his command. In obedience to his command. Verse 49 says, For I have not spoken of my own authority, but the Father who sent me gave me a command, what I should say and what I should speak. And I know that his command is everlasting life. Therefore, whatever I speak, just as the Father has told me, so I speak. Notice that Jesus doesn't merely speak on his own. He speaks for the Father. I and the Father are one, Jesus said. Notice in verse 49, first, that the Lord doesn't give an invitation. Right? He gives a command. It's not wrong to invite people to believe the gospel, but this is a command of God. The gospel is a command. The gospel comes with a command. The Father has given him a command to speak, and that command is for us. Verse 50, his command is everlasting life. Truly these times of ignorance God has overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. A commandment, by virtue of its very nature, requires obedience. It is a commandment. The response is obedience. It's not something that you can ignore. It's not something that you can disregard or set aside. Okay? It's not something that you can delay. Delayed obedience is what? Disobedience. It's not something that you can delay. It's not something that you can avoid. Jesus Christ is Lord. And he commands that you turn from sin and trust him alone. You can hear the word of God and not keep it, right? You can hear the word of God and not keep it. Jesus asked, who is he who loves me? He who keeps my commandments. Remember verse 39. Remember verse 39. I will not eventually becomes I cannot by the judgment of God. That's why it's such foolishness for people to think that they can come to Christ anytime they want to. What an absurd foolishness to think that on your deathbed, you're going to give your life to Christ. What a fool. What a fool. That's not what the Bible teaches. It's not going to work that way. Mm -hmm. the, the, that thinking is the fruit of really bad Arminian theology. That thinking is the fruit of really bad theology. The fruit of the gospel vindicates the wisdom of this command. False religion just leads to confusion. It leads to mindless, heartless ritual. It leads to death. You can look on the news every day and see false religion leading to death. You can, live, you can look at, quote, unquote, past Christian, quote, unquote, history. Those aren't Christians. That false religion leads to death, leads to confusion. It leads to everlasting punishment. Ultimately, it brings judgment. Verse 50 makes clear that truth Genuine Christianity, true saving faith, brings everlasting life. The command of God leads to changed lives, leads to joy and peace and everlasting life. That's the truth that's before you this morning. That's the truth that God presents to you this morning. The evidence for that, the evidence for that is the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Look to Christ. Believe in who he is. Believe in what he has said. Believe in him. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, who took the form of a man. He came to the earth, humbled himself, making himself of no reputation, came in the form of a bond slave, lived a perfect, sinless life, fulfilling the demands of God's law that you and I could not fulfill. We couldn't meet up to that standard. The Lord Jesus Christ did. Living a perfect life, he goes to the cross. Having lived a perfect life, now become a, becoming a perfect sacrifice, the Lord Jesus Christ humbles himself to the point of death, even the death of the cross. And he dies paying the penalty that you and I rightly deserve. He dies taking your punishment if you'll repent and believe in the gospel. So that by the grace of God in sending Christ, through faith in him, entrusting ourselves to him, we can have his righteous, perfect life, his righteousness imputed, credited to us, our sin imputed, credited to him. He bears the penalty for that. We bear the blessing of his righteousness. We inherit the blessing of his perfection so that we can be right with God and be in heaven. Declared innocent of all our crimes, against him and by grace through faith have everlasting life what grace right what mercy you'll own up to who you are apart from him 
humble yourself and turn to him, turn from your sin, turn to him in faith. This is the final call. Back in John chapter 12, this is the final call to unbelievers, so to speak. In John chapter 12, the public ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ is coming to a close. Their time is up. Is your time up? Is your time up? I will not eventually becomes I cannot. You can believe all the right facts about the Lord Jesus Christ and be on your way to hell. You can know all the right things about the Lord Jesus Christ and be eternally damned. You can think you're right all day long and that won't matter when you stand before God. What will you do with what you have heard? You know, theologians for years have talked about genuine saving faith in three components, three components, right? The first is Latin word notitia, it's knowledge. Knowledge, do you believe these things? These are the truths that have been presented. Do you believe these things? Knowledge, you have a knowledge of these things. Second fact, component of genuine saving faith is a census or assent. Do you believe in what you have heard? Do you trust in what you have heard? Do you know that what you have heard is right? Do you believe it? The third component of genuine saving faith is fiducia. It's fiducia, faithfulness, it's commitment, it's trust. You know these things, you believe these things, and so now you live in accord with them. Modern church has essentially, in many cases, modern professing church has abandoned that third component They've abandoned it in lawlessness, in antinomianism, in easy believism. Will you entrust yourself to him and live in accord with what you say you believe? You'll be judged according to that in that day when the Lord Jesus Christ comes back and executes judgment on all the ungodly according to their works. He offers to you today an opportunity to turn, an opportunity to turn from your sin and to entrust yourself to him. So foolish not to, amen? So foolish not to. Give your life to him. Repent, believe in the gospel. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, we acknowledge that we are all born in Adam. You've said that in sin, our mothers conceived us. We are brought forth in iniquity, and we are dead in trespasses. In and of ourselves, Lord, we are incapable. But you have commanded. Your word has gone out in righteousness. And you have sworn by yourself that every knee will bow and every tongue will take an oath. I pray, God, that you, you alone, who are able to do that work in the heart, would do it for your glory. God, that you would transform hearts and minds. You would take out that heart of stone, replace it with a heart of flesh. But this morning, you would bring sinners from death to life and dwell them with your spirit and make them trophies of your grace. That for your name, they would pr produce fruits of genuine saving faith these works, Lord, that you prepared that they should walk in them from before the foundation of the world. For your name, for your glory, it's a testimony of your grace and your mercy, and the power of the gospel to save and transform a sinner. Praise you and thank you for these truths. God, I pray that we wouldn't be left unchanged by them, knowing, God, that we have the word that will judge us in that day. You've offered this, Lord, in such grace, in such love, in such compassion, in such mercy to us. 
Help us even now, God, by your spirit to receive it, to hear it, and to do it. We love you, Lord, in Jesus' name.